Hi guys, Ollie here. I'm a final year graduate entry medical student at the University of Warwick due to graduate as a doctor in a couple of weeks and welcome back to my Your Life at Medical School series. Now today, obviously I am wearing a scrub top and wearing a stethoscope because today's episode is all about clinical skills. And clinical skills, as the name suggests, is the stuff you do in a clinical setting where you basically get to do doctory stuff. Broadly speaking, I think you can divide medical school into its academic or theory-based and its clinical components. So the academic stuff is what's tested in your written exams, your multiple choice questions and the like, whereas the practical side of things is what's observed when you actually see patients, examine them and undertake the various procedures that you need to know, venipuncture, cannulation, measuring a blood pressure and so on. But before we jump into the video guys, I just need to remind you once again to hit the like button for me and subscribe to the channel if you are not already. And make sure you click the little bell icon to make sure you get notified when a new video comes out. YouTube is being really weird at the moment, I don't really know what's going on, but videos aren't showing up in people's subscription boxes, so it would really, really help me out. But returning to the point at hand, of course, it's not always appropriate or indeed desirable to draw a firm line in the sand between the academic and practical components of medicine. Medical students and doctors obviously need both, both to make sure we pass all our various exams and competencies and to make sure that we're safe when we're seeing patients. Let's say you're examining a patient's cardiac system, for example, and they've got a murmur. What does that murmur mean? Why do they physically have it, what's going on, and medically, what does it mean? Why is it that their pulse might feel abnormal? This patient's got an elevated jugular venous pressure, what does that mean and what can we do about it? All of these things require you to not only have the practical examination skills to find the sign that something is wrong, but you also need the academic underpinning to understand why this has arisen in the patient. There are very, very many reasons why someone might have a heart murmur, but you need to be able to work out which one it is and if we need to manage it, and if we do, what we're going to do. So how does this actually work for you as a medical student going through your medical training? Well, classically, Virtually all clinical skills teaching used to be done via this see one, do one, teach one mentality that you will still see in many hospitals. If you wanted to learn how to take blood, for example, you might watch one of the senior doctors do it. The next time it needed doing, you would try and see whether you could do it. And once you'd manage that, you would then teach a junior to do it, either a junior doctor or a medical student. And I think it was thought that this would just cement the skill for you, which I'm sure it does, but unfortunately patients probably had to suffer quite a lot in that teaching process. But nowadays, however, we've thankfully moved on a little bit with our thinking and it's appreciated much more widely that patients are not simply passive participants for us to practice on. There is much more of an emphasis on simulation-based training. So for most five-year programs, I think this begins to happen in second or third year where you'll start to learn the basics of clinical practice. This does depend on the course, of course, and it should go without speaking that this massively depends on the particular medical school you attend. Some schools like to have you practicing your clinical skills right from the first year, like Warwick where I go. Some medical students won't go anywhere near a patient or even simulation until their clinical years in years three, four, and five. It really depends, but let's think about something like taking blood for the first time. In most medical schools, this is done on a dummy arm in a clinical skills lab. These are obviously high fidelity replicants of a real human arm, so they'll have arteries, veins, and skin. And so you can introduce your needle into a vein within the arm and successfully take blood. And even if you miss, it doesn't matter because obviously a dummy can't feel pain. These simulation environments provide a safe, space for your training where you can be supervised by a clinical skills tutor, which in practice is usually going to be a nurse or an ODP, and you can try as many times as you like and keep refining your technique until you reliably know what to do in the simulated environment, and that prepares you much better for when you go out onto the ward and you do it on a patient for the first time. And it's really important, of course, that we have these very seasoned veteran professionals teaching us how to do our clinical skills properly from first principles, because if we don't, we are a risk to our patients for several reasons. If we don't do our proper aseptic technique, we don't wash our hands, we don't wear gloves, we touch key parts of the apparatus that will come into contact with patients, 
that poses a really serious infection risk. We might cause them undue pain if we have to repeat the procedure multiple times and with something like an arterial blood gas, it can be extremely painful. And not to mention that eventually, when we're working as doctors, we will need to be able to do these things potentially unsupervised. So it's important to practice as much as we can to make sure that when it comes down to it, we are safe and competent for our patients. And the other thing to bear in mind is that different hospitals and different trusts within the NHS actually differ on how exactly they like their procedures to be done. For any clinical skill that you want to carry out, there will be a formulaic, well-documented way that that specific trust wants you to do things. Of course, it is the case that oftentimes people do not do things this very formulaic, rigid way in practice. I've certainly realized that doing my assistantship over the last three or four weeks. People do take shortcuts, but you need to learn the theory properly in order to be maximally safe. So coming back to the story, once you are deemed competent and signed off by one of these clinical skills tutors to be basically competent in the skill, as in you can do your nasogastric tube insertion, you can take blood or putting in a urinary catheter, you can then practice on real patients on the ward under appropriate supervision if it's needed and firmly with the patient's consent. And remember that consenting for clinical skills is as important as the clinical skill itself. And this is why it's as important to practice getting proper consent as it is the clinical skill that you're going to do, especially when it's coming up to exam season and these sorts of things are being looked at closely. What is consenting? Well, we all understand roughly what consent means. It's getting permission from someone for you to do something to them. The most common situation in which we hear about this is obviously sexual intercourse, where it's often not done properly, but it actually applies to anything we would do which interferes with someone's autonomy. And that includes any examination that we would do to a patient, any intervention or procedure we would do to them, or even something as simple as taking a history, because again, that is an intervention. So just to give you an example of what this might be like, let's say I was going to take blood from a patient that I'd not met before. So you might say something like, good morning, my name is Ollie, I'm one of the second year medical students. Dr. Perkins is my consultant, she's the doctor that's been looking after you, and she's asked me to come and take some blood from you today. Specifically, we're checking your infection markers to see if the infection is coming down and the antibiotic that we're giving you are working properly. Just to let you know, there are some risks of the procedure. There'll be a sharp scratch, so it's a little bit painful as the needle goes in. As always, when we're introducing something from the outside of the body to the inside, there is a small risk of infection, but I'll be using an aseptic non-touch technique in order to minimize the risk of this happening. Do you have any questions before we start? And if they're then happy for you to proceed with the full knowledge that you're a medical student, then you can make your best job of it and have a go. This may or may not go well, you know, odds are that if it's your first few times, you will miss. You'll cause them pain and not get the blood that you needed to get. But this is ultimately part of the learning process. And if a patient is happy for that to happen, then fine. If you're not confident, you can always ask one of the doctors or the nurses on the ward to supervise you, or if you're really not confident, ask to observe one of them doing it. That way you can correct any poor technique and get hints and tips from them to make sure that you do get it right when it's your turn. And just as we bring this video to a close, it's really important to point out that clinical skills and being competent with your clinical skills are a really important part of being a medical student and a doctor. I think as med students, we have a tendency to get very worked up about the academic components of the course. It's about who knows the most, who is in the top decile, who scores highest in all the exams, who's published the most papers, who has the most side hustles going on, all of that nonsense. But there is huge, huge practical value as far as patients and patient well-being is concerned in being able to cite that cannula first time, in being able to hit that vein first time without causing them pain hunting around if the needle's either gone through the vein or you've missed as you've gone in with the needle. And exuding confidence as you do it as well is also really important because if you're nervous, it's gonna make the patient nervous. So just try and relax, breathe slowly, you do know what you're doing, by the time you're doing a clinical skill on a patient, you have been deemed safe by somebody. So relax, do the best you can. It may not go perfectly, but that's okay. There will come a time when it does go perfectly. And now that I'm on my assistantship, I literally have a couple of weeks left of my medical placements before I graduate as a doctor. And I think throughout med school, I have really underestimated how important this side of medical school and this side of medicine is 
patients don't care about your exam scores, about your published papers, all the rest of it. They want you to hit the vein first time and not scratch their arm up and turn them into a pincushion while you do it. Good clinical skills will not only make you a better doctor, because your examination skills and procedural skills will be better and you're less likely to miss the things that you need to find in order to treat a patient properly. But like I say, the patient experience will also be so much better if they're confident in you as their doctor, and that counts for a huge amount too if not more than anything else. So thank you so much guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment and subscribe to the channel if you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to go and check out my website ollieburton.com where you can find this complete series of videos, all of my blog posts taking you all the way through my medical school journey. Take care, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.